Well, I would never say I went into full depression, but probably aspects of it. Because when you look back again and you reflect on those moments, you think to yourself, I needed someone almost like to grab hold of me and say, you know, you're not doing yourself any favours here. Mm. Uh, weight's creeping on you. You know, you're losing fitness. Probably say for, you know, a good year or two there, probably like completely lost. I think I got some insurance money and that was me kind of like almost still in the midst of rehab and having a load of money and it's not a good combination really because you don't know what to do next and you know you, you end up getting into some some things really that that you shouldn't be getting into alan tong's journey is a testament to perseverance and resilience he began as sir alex ferguson's first acquisition at manchester united despite challenges in breaking into the first team tong's passion for the game remained undiscouraged eventually he moved on to lower league football where he faced a career-ending injury. However, Tong did not let that setback stop him. He pursued his career, eventually obtaining a PhD in sports psychology, and he's widely acknowledged as a provident academic figure in the field of sport. Today, Alan shares his expertise as an academic and provides insightful commentary for Exeter City matches on BBC Radio Devon. Alan's newly released book, Red to Red, further illustrates his journey offering inspiration and underscoring the boundless nature of passion and welfare in football. Before this podcast begins, please do me a massive favour by clicking the subscribe button now below. It helps the channel grow. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and it's free. Enjoy the episode. Let's begin at the very early stages of your journey then. Growing up in Greater Manchester, how did football become a passion for you? Well, it was through me dad, really. Um, We were all sort of big Man United family and uh, member sort of as soon as I could walk, you know, going into the into the garden with my dad and, you know, playing, you know, different formats and scenarios. He used to pretend that United were in the last minute of cup finals and we'd need a goal to win and stuff like that. So all creating that sort of stuff. So uh, that was kind of my first kind of conscious memory, really, of football. And then just, just like a lot of young people, really, just going through the grassroots situation and uh, you know, playing. I remember playing like a year young. I was like nine, playing in under eleven side. Uh, managed to get involved with like Bolton School Boys, and then you know grassroots teams called Farmworth Boys, Moss Bank. Uh, ended up going to a team called Bolton Lads Club, and uh, just just enjoying my football really. And I really, you know, very fortunate to play in some good grass, grassroots teams, and you know, pick up a few trophies here and there. So. So that was kind of my me, uh, me early conscious memories, really, of, of playing football. You mentioned Bolton Lads Club. How did the opportunity come about in terms of going to Manchester United? Then, can you remember that that memory? Yeah, well, I, I was playing in. I was playing for Bolton School Boys, Christian. We used to have um, the the next representative team to that was Greater Manchester County. So I remember being sent down on trials there and uh, managed to get myself into the county side. And we'd play teams like uh, Cheshire and Merseyside, you know, like um, in competitive fixtures. And uh, one of the games, I think it was against Cheshire, and we played on Macclesfield Town's ground. It was called the the Moss Rose back then. And um, after the game, I had a, you know, a reasonable game, and uh, a, a youth development officer at Man United at the time called Joel Brown, he pulled me mum and dad and said, like, we'd like to invite Alan down for an extended trial over Christmas. And um, I think this was prior, Chris. I think I'd just started kind of training with United back then. We used to have a, a Bolton scout called George Knight um, who who came watching Bolton Odds Club quite a bit. So he, he was Bolton-based for Man United. And um, I'd been invited down to, to the School of Excellence on a Monday and Thursday night. Um, so following that, so Joe had said, like, well, Alan, come down for an extended trial and so we could have a look at him in in some game scenarios and uh, yeah it was I think it was going back a long time now uh, had a lot more hair back then going back to the uh, the Christmas around the Christmas time in 1986 also Alex Ferguson arrived in November 86 and the the trial was like in in December time so it was I think it was around December the 28th something like that so what was quite strange by then is it went over the new year um, and we ended up I think watching a game on New Year's Day they took us to Old Trafford and um, and we, we, we finished kind of the trial on, I think it was the 2nd of January. And, uh, you know, it's quite quite an intense situation. You know, going on trial is quite nerve-wracking because I'd, I'd been on trial at a few other clubs as well. Like I'd been to Bolton Wanderers, I'd been to Man City. And uh, it's almost like sort of clamouring for you for, to sign, you know, for these different sides. But, you know, being a Man United supporter and wanting to play for them, I think once they kind of offered something, 
uh, it was almost like <laughs> giving give us the pen sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started my my sort of career from then, really. Yeah. It was just short of me. My fifteenth birthday when I signed, so like still still fourteen as well, so still very young, uh, but not not quite as young as some of the players these yeah. days, you know. And was it that added pressure because of your upbringing and supporting Man United, and you mentioned the the the, the clubs that might have been interested as well? Uh, how did you cope with that intrinsically, and you know your kind of welfare and the development psychologically within that? Yeah, I mean back back then because I sort of you know loved playing football so much, I think probably playing a bit too much to be fair, I think. You know, you talk about welfare, and I think it's much more managed these days in relation to academy training. You know, playing on a weekend, but you know, when I was coming through the system, and it's interesting, Chris. I speak to quite a few players of my age now, and they always moan about bad knees and bad ankles, and you know, and you just you just didn't really know any better. You know, you probably a typical week for me would be Monday night United's training, sort of six to eight. Uh, Tuesday might be school team training. Uh, Wednesday night I'd train with my Sunday team like Bolton Lads Club because you could still play for the both back then um, Thursday night back at United 6 to 8 Friday night I'm having a night off a bit of a breather and then chances are Chris I'd probably be playing with either the school team on a Saturday morning or Man United's B team which is kind of the first kind of rung on the ladder and then a game with my grassroots team on a Sunday morning so like six days a week you know playing football mm. but I, did, I think I did sort of suffer for that but at the time you just go with it but I remember sitting in my GCSEs when I was 16 and I had like a two styes, like one on each eye. Well, clear signs that you're burning out or, you know, you're doing too much. You know, a sty on your eyes usually appear when you run down and they usually appear on one eye. So to have one on both eyes was like, you know, what's going on sort of thing. But but because you love football, you didn't really know any better and you just got on with it. You know, you, that, that was kind of how it panned out. Completely different world to how the modern day footballer is today then, I presume. It seems to have swung, you know, you talk about pendulum swings, you know, it's gone from almost like, you know, really tough, difficult, brutal, ruthless environments to, you know, a lot more player care now and a lot more, you'd like to think a lot more knowledge in the coaching as well, in in the way that they treat and operate and, and the way that they coach young players, you know, that's kind of come almost full, almost like a full tilt in a way, it's gone for like really, really difficult to almost like, not to be honest, you say, Really, really soft, but a little bit more gentle now, and I think a little bit more supportive than that. Talk to me about the culture of Man United then. So obviously, going into an environment where you've been brought up as a fan and the expectation put on yourself. You mentioned family and friends. Everyone knows Alan Tong as the potential Manchester United footballer. Talk to me about when you're in the academy and you're trying to break through. You mentioned the B team then. Talk to me about that that cultural aspect and how you dealt with that as a as a potential player trying to get into the first team yeah you think the the culture was a bit strange really a lot of difficult one to kind of work out I still to this day like you know I'm a lot older now but I like, wonder why it was like that at the time and you what sense that well it, you see I've like things like initiations and you know the the apprentices grew were you had like jobs to do you know uh, pumping balls or getting the first team training kit ready uh, cleaning the boots, cleaning toilets, cleaning showers. So, so re- really good to keep you grounded, but almost like a dark side to it because if you'd not done your job properly, so everybody got like a different responsibility, there'd be like a forfeit or a punishment for that. And, uh, you know, you probably smile a little bit about it and probably most of the listeners would think like, that sounds crazy, but you know, things like getting cakes in polish or if you didn't, you know, pump the balls up or... You'd have like Vaseline rubbed in your hair and a nightmare to get out, and um, you know, like re- really strange stuff and things that you couldn't work out. And you know, I mentioned some of this in in, in the book sort of thing. And and as a as a kind of a young sixteen, seventeen year old, it's it's like hard to you know, it's hard to work out because you you know you you're still you're still a child, really, aren't you? Mm. You know, and remember one incident that stands out for me, you know, even now was like I was playing. Uh, I got chosen to play for the under 18s in a cup final at Crew. Um, so what happened is they played uh, two games. So the first one had been played on the cliff. Uh, United had won that. Um, so going into the second leg, they must have had like some injury problems. So they they called on a few schoolboys, you know, to come and fill in some of the areas of the pitch. So I think I, they brought me in at right back. And uh, I remember Chris, like I was only 15 at the time. Like 15, you know, playing under 80s, it's, it's quite a big jump. And I remember that things seemed to be happening a bit quick. 
you know, your, your first touch had to be spot on because you'd be getting closed down by players who are a lot older than you. And uh, even now, I've got like a team photo of the of the the trophy win after that game, and I look really tiny on it. You know, you got lads like uh, Daniel Graham and Mark Robbins who played went on to play United, so it's like a lot stronger and a lot bigger than I was, and almost like this little lad on the end of the of the team uh, photo. Who look, you know, you, you look at him and you say, yeah, he's, he's definitely a fifteen year old. And I remember for some reason after that game that I got absolutely slaughtered by the youth team coach, like just out of nowhere, a real blasting. Uh, the dressing rooms at Gresty Road was quite tight back then, and it was a, it was a real, you know, like in your face kind of like loads of expletives, and you know, and you're thinking like as a 15 year old, I didn't really know how to deal with that. I think that, that definitely affected me because. Um, I, I thought, like, I've not even started at United full-time yet, like someone's ripping me to shreds like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember thinking, like, the sort of the youth team coach who did it, like, I did, I respected him, but that was, he got he got that completely wrong, for sure. And I remember coming out of that dressing room at that time, thinking, like, um, I didn't want to say to my mum and dad, like, you know, so you just close up a little bit, yeah. you know, and and then... Anyway, I was on. I went to the to the cliff, which where where we used to train on the Saturday morning. I was playing for the B team, and uh, I saw I saw the kind of youth coach on the stairs, and he's like, "You did apologise for Thursday night." So like, I'm sorry about that. And I I went a bit over the top there, but it's for your own good. But I think like for fif- I was 15 years old, thinking like, "Well, what's that mean for your own good?" So you know, it's going back to that point, Christy, there about player care and you know, like dealing with people. You know, it's almost like the knowledge wasn't quite there last night. Uh, in those, in those, in that time, because you're almost like getting treated like a professional player, mm. as though you're a mature player. Yeah. You're 15 years old, and then you know I think that that kind of like you know affected me a lot. Of that you mentioned, obviously, the, the players that you played with the under 18s, and obviously, kind of around your age group, the locks of Ryan Giggs, and you know the the, the well famous known football players that have came from Man United during that period. What was it like for them? Did did, did they ever kind of talk about kind of the the, the sink or swim situation that you put yourself in and the cultural aspect, because obviously it's praised a lot, and the, the, you know the extrinsic rewards that, that they went on to achieve, etc. I'm just interested on how they coped. As, just on reflecting on that, so it's a good question. You know, you, you know the the famed class of '92. They kind of come through as a group, didn't they? So they maybe could look out for each other a little bit more in the dressing room, and you know, maybe maybe not as isolated as maybe some of our groups that were coming through. And and um, yeah, it's, it's a great question, you know, because. Yeah, I'm sure they were, they were aware of these things because they've been mentioned in autobiographies. You know, some of the yeah. rituals and initiations and you know stuff that that was seemed a little bit random at the time. But I think it's all in that era was all about like masculinity and ha- you know having to pass certain things to get a chance and you know almost like to be part of a group or you know personally it's not what I do. You know, it's not it's not how I'd run things. But um, you know that that was kind of part of. I think not just not just United culture back then, but I think that was part of you know football culture in general because I played with a lot of people who have tales from their apprenticeship days that are quite dark and a little bit near the knuckle, and you know, and it just it just how it was, Chris. And I remember, I think it was in a Oliver Kay's book, Forever Young, where I think somebody complained about it. One of the pairs, somebody got wind of it, what was going on, and. Um, it was. It's written in there that it, it almost stopped overnight, you know, and then you know, obviously the Premier League kicked in, and you know things start getting a little bit more scientific, and you start getting uh, strength and conditioning, nutrition, you know, the foreign players start arriving, and you know, football started to change a lot, you know, the early nineties. And did that change management? Obviously, under Sir Alex Ferguson, and you know the the other coaches that were at Man United during your period. So to, how did that? You know that culture was set by them. You know, a, a top-down approach from a leadership point of view. That, is there anything that they kind of turned a blind eye to in terms of some of the, the connotations that you've mentioned, or is that just deemed as the the nature of football and you kind of get on with it? I'm just interested on on that as a concept. I think I think it was just the nature of like the the typical apprentice back then. I think it was driven more by you know almost like a sort of a shop floor culture, isn't it? Where you know I'm sure there's people that. Have had apprenticeships in other industries where you know the new kid on the block gets wound up a little bit, yeah. you know, in in relation to sort of you know testing them out a little bit, maybe testing the character, you know, which is fine, and I understand that testing characters and building characters is an important part of football. 
but I think um, you know ways and means of doing that. And do. but uh, I think from the from the top down, you know, like Sir Alex, like winning culture. I don't think he really knew you know fully because he, he, everybody's distance. Like you, you're in the same building, but you've kind of got a youth dressing room, a resi dressing room, a first team dressing room, and yeah. you know, it'd be just like the youth coaches kind of we'd be dealing with more than more than not. Um, but you know, the, the the times that they did kind of pop their heads in, it was almost like a sort of like, what's going on here? What the you know, what the hell's going on? And and it just almost be laughed off and forgotten about. But you know, that that's just the way it was. And you talk about you know building character and things like that. I'm sure some of the stuff I went through had helped me on like a bit later on in my life when I sort of needed to to draw on a bit of character. What would you say to those that are listening to this podcast and they might challenge? that aspect from yourself you mentioned that masculine culture Just people might be listening going come on Alan, get on with it you know stop showing weakness what would you say to, to to people such as that that might challenge you know the nature of making it as a footballer and they don't necessarily understand but they're trying to find insight yeah I mean, you know it's there's ways and means chris you know you don't but I've, I, I always look i mean there's, i'm sure there's been you know like you talk about academic research on on sort of bullying and banter you know like there's very fine lines to it isn't there and you know, I think that probably be it'd be sort of one way to look at this, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got on with stuff and you know managed to get through the youth teams and played in the FA Youth Cups and uh, managed to to sort of like progress in a reasonable manner. Played in the sort of central league for the reserves and you know, I think I, was, I think I was doing okay in there, but I think like like most people, Christy, I think you know maybe my personality was a little bit sensitive, a bit shy, all you know, through my upbringing and. Um, but you know, and that's not that's not to say that sensitive and shy people can't give hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, you know, and the, it's just not like that at all. But but I think I think sort of from the United journey, you know, I was quite happy with it up into a certain stage, and then you know, at the end of the day, it's it's a tough jump going into the first team squad and the first team to survive at that level. And you know, that's 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 one step that I just found a little bit too much. What was too much about it then? So kind of dissect that down. Yeah, I think I think just. Just probably, I mean, everybody's got levels on the, if you think about, think about elite level boxers, you've got, you know, you've got lads who are sort of Commonwealth level, European level, um, you've got lads who are world title level, you know, maybe my level was, you know, I think everybody finds it only in, in relation, you know, football's a big world, you know, they, it might sound surprising to the listeners, but there is life outside the Premier League, although you wouldn't think so, Championship League, One League Two, you know, the, 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 the non-leagues now are a lot more professional than they used to be, and I think I think everybody kind of finds a level, and I think although your uh, your dreams and your and your ambitions is to play, you know, in the first team at Man United, but that that's kind of afford, afforded to very few. You've got to be absolutely fantastic for you. You more or less, if you get into the first team, you're, you're guaranteed international standard, are you? And I think I think that I think that step, you know, in relation to your question, is just just for a little bit. Just a little bit of a, of a, of a too much of a, of a step yeah. for myself, but you can never know really because you never got the opportunity. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's all easy in hindsight, isn't it? But you need opportunities to prove something, and unfortunately, back then we had a lot of pros. You know, and you had to be. Yeah, you know, I had to get my front in, uh, uh, myself in front of about six or seven players that to get a chance. And you know, these days you think about you know you get like seven subs and stuff like that. Yeah. You get obviously European football where the first team might have had a really good group, and you get the last game might be away somewhere and send the youngsters, you know, to get an opportunity. Um, but you know that's that's the way it was. That was I think is that was my destiny. Yeah, oh, that was kind of going to lead me on to my next point. Really, you think about the modern game. You mentioned the, the seven substitutions, even the commercial element of going out on loan, and the global aspect of playing in different countries, down the leagues as well, the competitions even stronger you know in, in 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 down the leagues and the experiences that you can learn from that do you feel like that maybe if your time was this era it'd be a different story and you maybe your journey would be different it's tough to say because because the things change a lot don't they over the generations and you know i'm a i'm a great believer in things happen for a reason but mm. um you know going back to my era is nothing apart from the top players in football there would nobody really had an agent say what they weren't heard yeah. about and mm. You know, when I, when I came away from Man United in the early nineties, I was having to like phone clubs up myself, you know, to to ask them if they fancied having a look at us. And you know, I remember like speaking to um, to to a manager at Macclesfield Town at the time, 
spoke to a manager at Bolton Wanderers just to say, like, you know, do you fancy having, bringing us on trial for a few weeks? And you know, almost like the, the deselection experience at Man United was like, you're just sort of left to it. Hmm. You know, you, in these days, I think it's, it's managed a lot better in relation to we'll try and support you as much as we can yeah. in relation to getting your other opportunities. But, you know, back in that day, you know, my apprentices and the, the young pros era then was almost like, uh, once your contract's finished, you know, if you've not got fixed up by, you know, the club helping you, yeah. you know, it's down to yourself really to, to do that, which was a bit disappointed because, you know, I'd, I'd been at United since I was 14 years old. I was now 19 and a half and, you know, to, to leave in that manner was, was, was quite sad really. Hi, I'm Dr. Alan Tong. Uh, please subscribe to the Christy Scanlon podcast. The link is below. Can you remember that day? The day where you were released? Can you, can yeah. you, can you explain to the viewers and listeners what the day was like? Yeah, it was, I've gone through kind of the season. I've played all right, but again, all right's not enough at Man United, is it? You've got to be like, you know, I'm not I honestly say that, you know, I can't say I was outstanding or anything like that. But yeah, we'd had a, like a strange run into the end of the season. So, so again, I don't know completely different these days, Christy. I think that a lot of football is now probably informed maybe around Christmas time, January, whether what's going to, ha- what's going to be happening to them so they can prepare themselves. So I think we got to about May and like nobody had been told about whether they were getting a contract extension or the contract renewed. And uh, it went to that. I was playing in like the A-team league at the time, like Lancashire League Division 1, and we'd gone to uh, the last week of the season where we started to play four matches due to cancellation. So I think we played like Burnley on the Saturday. We had a game on the Tuesday night, the Thursday night, and the Saturday morning. So so we won the first three games. It went to a bit of a cliffhanger to, uh, We chasing City it was us and City for the for the Lancashire League and I think there was like a point in it so if City won obviously they win the league if we won we won the league so anyway we managed to beat them 2-1 so you know we, we got we got like the Lancashire League title which was brilliant and um, Sir Alex Ferguson was watching that game so he come down with his assistant Archie Knox and then after the game he'd said like you did, you did really well this morning like he singled me out for praise which was really nice so again, in the time, you're just thinking, well, that sounds all right. All contract yeah. extensions are coming up. So that's quite positive. You're getting some praise off the manager. You know, that, that, that might stand me in good stead. So anyway, I think it got to the Tuesday of the week after. And it was Brian Whitehouse, who was the Man United reserve team manager at the time. he come down into the dressing room and said, like, so Alex wants to see you. So I thought, well, I knew what was coming. So I thought, all right, okay. So I went upstairs, uh, knocked on his door, like, come in sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, almost like Lord Sugar and the Apprentice just delivered it straight away. We're not going to renew your contract. Uh, we feel as though you, you, you like what do you say? You, you're lacking a yard of pace to become a first team regular player and the first team sort of player at Man United. So, so it's like uh, in the moment, it's like you've just been. You know, they say that the hardest hits are the ones sometimes you don't see coming, and um, you know that that was kind of a really tough experience to go through because it's like, you know, Man United is your club. It's your, you know you, you've supported them all your life. And then to get that news delivered to you like by the manager, it's like, you know, probably a myriad of thoughts. What do I do now? What do I say to him? Do I beg him for a chance? Uh, do I start crying? Do I get emotional? You know, what what is it that I'm supposed to do here? And uh, I just remembered saying to him, like, you know, thanks for the opportunity. You know, it's been an absolute privilege uh, to play for Man United. And, uh, you know, that that was it. Christy was almost like, right, that's the way it's going to go. He said, he said to me that we'll try and get you fixed up with something else so he did he did he did say that but then after i'd come out of his office it's like i uh, just went straight out to training and like and i think i'm, I'm no in absolutely no condition to be training really it's like you almost like the emotional impact of that taking over your biomechanics like i was struggling to you know com- comprehend it come to terms with it you know it just just com- felt completely isolated at that moment i didn't know who to speak to what to say you know, so I remember going out and training. I think we went over to Littleton Road, which was a another training ground at United. And I think it was Paul. Paul Ince was in the same session. You know, so he's out. What well, things stick with you? And um, I give the ball away. I think or I had a bad touch. And he was like straight on me straight away, like saying, "Oh, come on, you need to improve." That was that's rubbish, lad, and all that. And you're like, "I just had me out, bro." Okay, he doesn't know that. Yeah. But dealing with that was pretty tough. And um, I think for that period, then from sort of. May, June, you know, you're just ticking down time, you know, till you sort of leave the club and, you know, it was just like a slow, almost like gone to the electric chair, like a slow death leaving United. Yeah. And I think when I when I kind of left the training ground for the last time, you know, I thought, well, 
lots of players were kind of like helping themselves to kit and you know boots taking stuff but I mean, United was my club I, I never did that that yeah. wasn't for me sort of that behaviour because I've not been brought up like that you know you, you, you're nicking stuff aren't you really but that, that wasn't for me Christy and so that was it that was my destiny so you got so almost like there but not there in but not in you mm. know you come so far in your journey and just that last little bit kind of found you out so it's like yeah. you just like slide down out to the bottom of a slip like a slippery pole and and it's like, it's like well you know it's my critical moment say where, where do I go from here mm. how did you find so Alex what was he like as a person still a winner really yeah you know he's very invested in the youths you know very you know come to watch all the youth team games and and how, how it was, Christy, back then is like United's youth teams would play on the Saturday morning. So you'd have a game at Littleton Road or on the cliff if you was in the B team, Littleton Road, cliff eight, uh, on the cliff, the A team. And United obviously won't kick off then. So it'd be like, we're, 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 in, the, we're in the midst here of three o'clock kickoffs on a Saturday. So, you know, a high percentage, Sir Alex or Archie Knox, who was assistant manager, would come down and watch the first half of the B team. Or they'd watch the A team and then they'd go off to, to Old Trafford then for one o'clock, half one to, to start preparing the first team. So so ve- very invested in youth. Um just just remember him as just being a very passionate, uh, fiery, ruthless uh, individual. Um just a winner and just, you know, the, to to go on to to have the career he had was like unbelievable, really, wasn't it? So but um, you know, just just for a short time, Christy. I mean, like, I'm a big Man United fan. I always say, like, if I could have had five minutes in the B team and pull that shirt on and come on for somebody, you know, like, that would have done me. And to kind of get through the the youth team uh, reses, you know, I played like a first team friendly at Histon, which was exciting. You know, to get that, I mean, that everything was a bonus, I think, in, in that shirt. But again, you as an individual, you always want that next thing, don't you? And just, it just fell short for me, yeah. So, like a sense of if you go back to the Ferguson, an obsessive behaviour, winning behaviour, you know, not normal to 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 some people. Do you know in terms of you know, the stories of him being in his office, you know, first thing in the morning, last one to leave, uh, energy work rate, you know, the longevity that he's been on. But what kind of characteristics did you sense from him when you were there? Yeah, it's him really, and I think it's only when you learn later on, like down the line, where that maybe came from, and all that he got a bit of a a knockback, you know, playing for Rangers. I think he got singled yeah. out, you know, yeah. watching his documentary, Never Give In. Yeah. He speaks about, like, the Rangers manager pulling him in after the cup file. I think Billy McNeil scored, like, an old Celtic centre-half, scored a header off a corner. I think Sir Alex got blamed for that. Like, Rangers was his boyhood club, wasn't it? It was something to do with his wife was a Catholic and the anticipation or the kind of the negative atmosphere from the crowd, from yeah. the Rangers' perspective... Uh, was kind of led into kind of a, a turmoil for him during that period. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a club you love, isn't it? Mm. So when that the club you love almost turns you back on you, it kind of maybe propels you or gives it, gives you that energy to maybe go on to do something else. You know, he managed to find it through his management, didn't he? You know, he went on to do some great things with Aberdeen, ended up at United. So I think that's what drove him almost like that mm. that failure. And I think in some ways that failure at Man United kind of drove me in. You know, to do other things mm-hmm. as well, not just in football, because I come out of football really young, but you know, in, in other parts of my life as well. Talk to me about that period then. So you mentioned leaving Manchester United and everything that's happened. You mentioned the kit element, and now you're uh, stripped from everything, really. You mentioned your identity as well, and now that has been taken away. And then you get the opportunity to go to Exeter. So talk to me a little bit about that transition and how you cope with that and especially at the age that you're in, you know, quite vulnerable as well at the same time. Just just talk to me about how that worked out for you and relocating, et cetera, and trying to promote a career again. I, I always thought that I still had something to offer. You know, I'd been at United since I was 40. I was now 19 and a half, and I thought it wasn't really the end of the road for me, but it's going to be tough to, to come back. So I ended up going to, um, I went to a non-league, I went to Bolton Wanderers first of all. They sort of called me down and said, well, we'll have a look at you for a week or two. So I went down and played a few games for that, and we, we couldn't come to an arrangement. So that was disappointing as well. Um, so I ended up dropping into the non leagues from there. So that the the, fo- the fall sometimes can be quite a long one. You know, you're playing at Man United in the reses, and then all of a sudden you're playing for like a team in the Northwest Counties, or you know, it's quite a steep decline, really. So so I went there for a, a few months, Christy, and then how, how it came about for me was this sounds absolutely crazy, but it, it's what happened that it was a neighbour who knew. The manager at Exeter at the time called Alan Ball, a former World Cup winner, 
who'd phoned Alan Ball at Exeter and said, like, well, I know someone who lives not far from me who's been at United and um, would you fancy having a look? And the link there was, when I was a young player at Man United, I'd gone away with the Football League. I got chosen to play against the Russian Football League in Moscow. Right. And Alan Ball was like part of the, the managerial team for that for that squad. So he kind of like knew me from there. And he said like he'd seen a couple of um, Central League games as well like when I played in the Reses. So so he said, yeah, come down. So so that's how I went down in the, I think it was kind of the winter time, about December, November, December 1991. And then I stayed in Exeter till, till kind of the mid-90s. Um, give me a short term contract till June when I when I kind of first arrived, and then picked up a couple of contracts after that as well. So I you know, really enjoyed my time down in Exeter, but you know, a bit of a culture shock. Um, you know, Man United was kind of uh, you had everything done for you, you had all the training, your kit laid out, and you had like your own. You know, you could get boots when you wanted them and things like that. And Exeter, you had to you know clean your own kit. <laughs> it ended up with me one of my mates in the. Um, in the lawn drought on a Sunday night, getting all the training kit ready for the for the week after. But in good grounding again, you know, it, it's great. it builds character, Chris, it does that sort of thing. And, you know, it makes you, you know, you think, well, I'm 19 and a half, I've got to grow up sooner or later. And and I, I honestly, I absolutely love my time in Exeter. I've some, met some great people. It's a beautiful part of the country. And, uh, you know, so, so fortunate to still be in touch with sort of Exeter to, to this day. And, you know, what a fantastic club they are. What did you learn from that experience? Is there anything that stands out on reflection? Um, I learned that football is about opinions. Uh, so Alex Ferguson said I lacked a yard of pace. Alan Ball said I was pretty sharp. <laughs> that's a bit random, wasn't it? So, so that that's interesting. Who's right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to the bar. Think, <laughs> but um, no, I think I think I learned that you know it, it's about opportunities, isn't it? And just trying to grasp opportunities when they come and. You know, strangely enough, it was through injuries that I got my the man, my uh, opportunity at Exeter City. They had a, a, a right back there at times, a really good player, went on to have a good career called Scott Hiley. I think he went on to play for Man City and Birmingham City. Yeah, you, ought to, you might remember him, Christy. And uh, he was injured and that ball, he called me, I think on the Wednesday, Thursday, like, so Scott's like not playing on, we'll be able to play on Saturday. You know, you, you're playing right back. So so I think that was just short of my 20th birthday. So I was 19 when I made my debut, which is, again was you know something I'm really proud of. And um, you know, played in that game, and then went on to, I wouldn't say, become an established player. I was a bit in and out over my season or two. I had a, picked up a couple of little niggly injuries, and and again, but you know, I played in some really nice fixtures. You know, played in the Devon Derby, I beat Plymouth Argyle, which is Exeter's, you know, their big big rival sort of thing. And uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is I managed to to get man of the match away at Stoke City on a <laughs> cold, wet. Uh, windy evening, you know, they say that's the mark of a player, Christian, only, you know, can you do it at Stoke on that sort of evening and wearing the number 10 shirt as well. Oh, so, wow. you know, that was uh, that was mad. So, yeah, so, so really nice times, Christy. But again, you know, as we know, life's not a straight line. It doesn't run in a, you know, a clear manner. You know, there was a, another uh, issue hanging on the horizon for myself. You mentioned injury then. So talk to me about how you coped with, well, let the listeners know what the injury was. Uh, and how did you cope with that? And yeah. well, my second point to that is, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, burnt out. And you mentioned academia and the element of early specialisation, diversification, all these different academic research that has been published, you know, more contemporary. Well, how did you cope with that? And, you know, you know, what, what's your thoughts on it overall? So let's, let's have a think about the injury. The injury was like a, a real bad one. Like I, I started getting pins and needles in my feet and my legs. I knew my contract was running out and put you under pressure again because again... How old are you now, Adam? I'm around 22 now. So about 22 years old. So again, that, that experiences that I had through United culture almost brings you to a stage where it's like you, you know, you, you're kind of digging in. You, you know, you're this kind of like nothing bothers you. And I, you know, it's, I've only got a niggly back and pins and I'll be all right. And <laughs> and it, it just, you know, mad enough, I just kept playing with this for a spell. And I don't know whether that was out of worry for a new contract or because I'm thinking, well, if I don't, if I'm not in and around the first year, I'm not I'm going to get another contract here and I'm going to be in, in, an, in back to square one again. So I just, I just kept playing with it like stupid, really. I mean, I remember one game, I think ended up like, ended up, rubbing um, deep heat on my spine and you know to, just to get me out there and play and you know and it's just just mad when you look back at it but it got to a stage where you know I, I just 
couldn't really run anymore and I was struggling to get out of bed and so then I decided to go and see the physio so I've got a problem here and he said so we'll better send you for a scan so I went to French A hospital in Bristol uh, give us a an MRI scan and you know the bottom of my spine was in a mess it was really bad and um you know the surgeon operated the, had two operations on it uh, first operation he said was really serious um he said that I'd have like I needed spinal fusion doing so I needed screws and plates putting in my back and he said that one bad tackle or one where something where you might have gone up to win a header and collapsed down and fell down and so that could have severed like your spinal as you would have been like in a wheelchair it would have been really serious so you're thinking like all that playing and like oh I'll be all right. It's just stupid, but but that 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 was kind of the nature of of my mentality back then. Um, it was almost like you know you can't show any pain, you can't show anything that's bothering you, and and um, yeah, it come to a stage, Christy, where you know, I was in a, a rehabilitation program then for about twelve months or so, you know, to try and get myself back to some level of fitness. That again was a, a, a difficult journey for myself because you're isolated, you you're on your own, you're having to do your your swimming, your weights, you know, all the all the kind of strength exercises and, you know, that was, uh, it proved troublesome and it come to a stage where I had to have another operation because I was still getting pins and needles. So they opened me up again and um, following that, I had a surgeon, so I, would, I don't know if like full, full-time football is going to be the right thing here because it's it's you're taking a chance really. And I think from a mental perspective, you're thinking, well, if you're going up for a challenge, you're getting a knee in the back or something, or you come crashing down after a challenge, yeah, it's like... At the same. It's not the same, Christy. I think mentally I was kind of like shot then. I think it was time to start thinking <clears> about, you know, what what other things I could do and where my future future was lying. I mean, I did try to play. I, went, I dropped again into the non-leagues and you know, played like part-time. But I think I think by then, you're talking here, by maybe midnight, I think all my love had kind of... Mm. You know, I almost died for football. Um, I think that was... Everything had a beginning and everything <clears throat> to end, Christy. I think that, that that was my destiny. Did you know during that rehabilitation? Did you kind of know in the back of your mind? I, I think so, and I, I think I think I mentioned in the book, Christy, about I think Exeter at the time were, were in a bit of a perilous plight, finance wise, like no money. So you, you're thinking, well, you're coming to the end of the contract. They're not gonna they're not gonna like pay somebody like eighteen months for for something that they don't even know whether you'll get back anyway. So I think we're talking, you know, perilous in the respect of, you know, back then players weren't getting wages. There was things that were going missing. The PFA was stepping in. So not not the best. I think a season or two after Exeter nearly went under. So I didn't realise, that's another thing I didn't realise at the time until later on in my life, how bad that was because you're just young, aren't you? you don't, you're, still, you're still relatively young. You just don't understand, but there's no way they're going to pay me to, to rehabilitate. So mm. almost like my mind was kind of getting like made up and, and pushed Seen as an asset rather than a human. Yeah, well, again, it's another situation. There's no careers officers in football clubs. There's no, you know, people to really speak to. And you just, again, you just go. I think I got um, some insurance money, um, and that was me, kind of like almost still in the midst of rehab and having a load of money. And it's not a good combination, really, because you're completely lost and you don't know what to do next. And you know, you, you end up getting into some. Some things really that that you shouldn't be getting into, like what? Well, drinking too much, drinking, um, sort of almost like pubs become your refuge in a way because you're suffering a bit. So you you know you go in you, Monday, Tuesday, third, Wednesday, Thursday, all through the week you go and drinking and you know, a bit of gambling and it's like you're thinking, well, you know, you're completely lost. I've been a footballer and I'm not that anymore. So I think I think I probably you know like grief model, like I went into sort of denial and. Almost elements of depression. I, don't, I would never say I went into full depression, but probably aspects of it. Because when you look back again and you reflect on those moments, you think to yourself, it was poor behaviours. I needed some steer. I needed someone almost like to grab hold of me and say, you know, you're not doing yourself any favours here. Mm. Uh, weight's creeping on you. You know, you're losing fitness. And, um, you know, was for, for a spell or two, Christy, I think, probably say for you know, a good year or two, they're probably like completely lost and, you know, that rud- rudderless, directionless. Could you watch Man United? Could you could you watch the success on the TV as a fan? You know, yeah, I think I think I still followed them. You know, you're still sort of picking up. You know, United obviously won the Premier League when I was at Exeter. You know, ninety two, ninety three season. 
and then they kind of went on a really good run. Like they beat Chelsea in the FA Cup final. I think it was four nil. And then they think they beat a bit later on, like be Liverpool one nil. Think Canton now scored late, and so you're keeping an eye on it. But I think I think escaping Man United is always tough because like biggest club in the world, aren't they? Well, that's my point. You can't escape it, can you? You know, the the Premier League's kicked off by now, and you know it's, you're well into that, and you know football's changing at a rate of knots, and it's, it's you know I, I, now it's twenty four seven, isn't it? We've got Sky Sports, mm-hmm. we've got media channels, and it's everywhere, isn't it? It envelops you, it's all around you, and. And I think I think escaping that might have been useful, but unfortunately you can because it's just there. I always used to laugh, Christy used to say, Well, if I went to the moon to escape it, there'd be a marsh in there with a Man United shirt on. <laughs> so yeah, it is tough, but because it's like almost like a bit I I think I've said it in previous podcasts, like it's almost like a bittersweet symphony. You love the club, you support the club, but it didn't quite work yeah. out for you there, if yeah. that makes sense. So I think yeah. I think it's like a, a bit of a strange feeling at times. So talk to me about how you got into your academic journey and then obviously the, the, the book presented today from red to red. Talk to me about the journey from that moment you mentioned that you were lost to kind of coming into this academic element where a lived experience has probably gave you some intrinsic drive to look at psychology, well-being, player care and then creating you know a, a, a kind of a, a book for us to, to look at. I, th- I think it was like, I, I got to 28, I'd, I'd gone through like a sort of a bit of a, you know, a few series of jobs, working for like a warehouse company for a bit and do some delivery work and, and I just, and I never really, I think back then, you know, going back 25, 30 years now, I never really saw university as like, for me, if that makes sense, because almost like I had a different viewpoint of it back then. Mm. But I think when I went back to university, Chris, it was almost like, different variations of degrees were starting to appear so we realized sports science and you know the can nutrition you know they're just starting you know now you can you know there's all sorts of performance analysis strength and conditioning you know, we really caught which is great but uh, i never really saw myself as like a university student we just got to a stage where i think i think it was one of my family members might be my mum who said you know do you not fancy re-engaging with your education so you'd You'd been Ian Man United. You'd done BTEC back then. You had to go through like like these days. You get through put through the college kind of system, and um, I thought, well, I'd go to maybe have a chat with somebody at an open day, and you know, I told them a little bit about my background, where I'd been, and they said, well, well, maybe maybe picking up some quals in that area might enable you to to try and get a job back in sport somewhere. So yeah, so I started my degree in two thousand. So I got a you know, it was it was the um, sports science and leisure I had to do. I had to I'd do like a joint because there wasn't enough for a full sports science degree. So I picked that up, Christy. And then when, when, once I did that, I kind of got the book for it and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the lectures and, you know, the, the, the experience was really good. And almost through that period thinking, I could see myself maybe teaching. You know, I could see myself maybe delivering material because, again, like a lot of people, you, you observe and you watch people in action and it kind of appealed really. So, so coming out of my degree, I uh, did my teacher training qualification straight away, my PGCE. Um, and then, you know, following that, I've picked up a master's degree in philosophy at Liverpool, John Moores. And then I went on to, to complete a PhD that um, that was completed in uh, 2020, again, at Liverpool, John Moores. And, uh, you know, that, that was kind of the time where I thought, is is there something there where I could maybe write a little bit about this journey that, that might help young players who've been released or people who had to retire through injury in relation to, you know, there, there is life after football. You know, you can find other directions in sport. And um, that was kind of, you know, where, where I'm at so far on my journey. So what can people gather from the book then? Is there any key elements of that? You mentioned, you know, life after football. But, you know, for those listening or watching, they might be intrigued by your story, Alan, but they also want to maybe invest and, and read your book. Um, itself what what kind of things are in that can you maybe just give a bit of a summary on what what's included yeah just, just like everybody christy really isn't it i think i think life's full of ups and downs isn't it it's full of challenges it's full of adversity um it's full of critical moments disappointments highs lows so just i think i think just to start message really of of like just ne- never giving up and just looking for different things and um i think i think it's always i think football as an industry um, it, it can tend to forget you quite quickly, unfortunately. I mean, I'm, I'm going back into sort of 90s, early 90s here, and, you know, you look at the size of staffing now, it's like enormous. And, you know, back then you have like a resi manager, a physio, a first team manager, maybe a youth coach, and 
the opportunities were really low, and um, I think I think you almost had to get an opportunity by, you know, almost being um, somebody that the manager knows well, you know, to, that they've played with for their careers, you know, from, from a trustworthy element. I, I get all that, but when myself, I was only like a young player, I'd only made like a handful of appearances, I got twenty seven appearances, and all well, the credibility that I had from a football perspective wasn't really going to fit into a coaching role, you know, at that time. Yeah. So, so coming away from that, I think I think the message is like if it does happen to any young player or any, you know, there is options. I think I think these days there's there's lots more, Christy. I think as a young player coming out of the system, anyway, you get chances to play in America, do degrees in America, and so it's a lot better than it was. And um, but ultimately, the dream is to play in the first team, isn't it? And I think I think that's that's where your majority falls short. And I think. I think that's what maybe this book will appeal to. It will appeal to the majority more than the minority. You know, it's not about Premier Leagues and winning FA Cups. Yeah. It's about experiencing things and learning from them, reflecting on them, and you know, trying to move your life in a in a slightly different way. Do you think the element of football misses that aspect? You see the glamorous perspective of becoming a footballer, even when you look at you know youth academy systems and what it could be to be a footballer and the extrinsic rewards and the lifestyle. But there seems to be an underlying area that's missed. Do you think that's kind of where this book is targeting? But possibly. You know, you, football really is roots. Its roots are entrenched in the working classes, aren't they? And, you know, you talk about modern football, Christy, and you, you're right, it's expensive to follow now. And, you know, it's 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 if you, if you do manage to, to break into the first team, you know, you, you can have lads here now who've never... Never really played very much. You were on monster contracts, and you know if you if you sign a big contract now at seventeen, obviously that sets you up for life, doesn't it? And you know the, it's an incredible world, and you know those highs, it's exhilarating, but you know it's ruthless as well. It's like dog eat dog. It's it's t- it's a tough world to survive in, and you know I've got all the all the credit needs to go to the lads who get there and stay there, and you know mm. it's not easy to to navigate the world of pro football. You know the media intrusion, the media interest, and you, you know they won't leave you alone. You're, you're on channels twenty four seven. Anything that you do that's slightly out of kilter is reported, isn't it? So it is tough, isn't it? And you know you talk about that silent mental health challenges that are in there. You know they're still alive and kicking. It's just that our culture seems to keep a lid on that, or certainly the football culture does. How did you find writing, writing the book? Were you inspired by, obviously you mentioned your PhD. How did you find the process of, of, of getting pinned down to, to paper and you know yeah, putting words together? Really good. Well, I used to, it was a lad who's wrote, um, a lad who played for Everton and Man United in the Premier League, John O'Kane. He'd wrote his book and, um, you know, I've I'd, I'd only been in football five minutes, Chris, and I said to Michael Carvey, like, do, is, do you think there's enough here to, to maybe put something together about my journey and, you know, talking about the, the Man United and Exeter and coming out of the game. And he, he said, yeah, he said, I, th- I think so. So I used to meet Michael uh, in coffee shops uh, over a period of two years and uh, we'd do different stages. We'd like, we'd talk about the grassroots element and then Man United and scout getting scouted and then coming through that and then released and then going to Exeter and, you know, coming out the other side and to talk about, like, some mental health aspects and some views on the modern game, and so I think he said, "I think there might be something there, you know, to to, to maybe have a have a go at." And I was talking to a lad, at, um, and, you know, I'm fortunate enough because I signed a pro deal at Man United. I'm in the ex players association, and I was talking to a lad at a dinner a couple of years ago, and he said, "Like, you know, who are you? What's your background?" And you know, when I said, "Like, I'd come through that journey and got a PhD," at the end, of it, he said, "You should write a book." <laughs> I said, "Funnily enough, we're still like we're in the card at the mid at the moment, so." So hopefully, yeah, you know, hopefully it'll appeal to a range of people, not just Man United, Exeter, you know, football people and, uh, you know, people who are interested in something a bit different. It's not a story of winning Premier Leagues and FA Cups. It's something that, you know, it's a a little bit of a different angle to it. But, um, you know, anybody who reads it and anybody who's kind enough to, you know, to purchase it and, you know, let let us know your thoughts and Mm. what you think about the story and, you know, what what it kind of like mounts up to. Have you found the process a way of reflecting upon your journey and yourself and also from the PhD perspective and the journey that you've been on from an academic point of view, psychology and understanding the mindset, understanding cultural aspects that could impact uh, behaviour after football, etc. Has that enabled you to really start to reflect on about 
on who you are as an individual and your purpose in life definitely christy and you know i think i think we, we speak about this don't we Val values you know don't don't compromise your values you know in if you if you know things are not right you know you have to stand your ground sometimes or you and you know almost almost like takes courage to stand alone sometimes like you know things are not right but you know maybe maybe i don't know going back into apprentice days maybe having a bit more courage to maybe knock onto alex's door and say like you know i need to you know what what do i need to do to get into this first team and things like that and you know maybe i wasn't at that kind of uh, psychological and physical and physiological development back then to do that you know maybe I didn't have enough confidence in myself to to maybe go through that process but, but as you say Chris it's all a journey isn't it? it's all about learning it's all about you know giving yourself aims and objectives to try and aspire to and and just just trying to try different things as you go through your life yeah. like like everybody just trying to aspire to a little bit of happiness and you know making sure that you're content and and you're doing things in the right way, and you know you're just you're just trying to to, to mirror that. I think the values that my mum and dad instilled in me in relation to you know what what they taught, what I learned off them, you know, in, into sort of like uh, your career and, and and the way that you act and the way that 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 um, that, that that you that you grow on your life in your life. So, final question, Alan. Where does the future hold? Then, obviously, you mentioned your, your academic journey, the book that's out. You know, your, your media role as well. We won't forget that. Well, what does the future hold for you? Is there anything that you set out from a, you know, a, a career perspective that might be able to, to influence others and guide e- others in, in different ways? I'm just interested on where this leads you. Yeah, it's always a tough question, isn't it? I mean, I'm 52 now and you always ask these... Still young. The, still young. <laughs> the students who come in, like, what do you want to do? I think yeah. it's a real tough question for anybody, isn't yeah. it? But I think, I think I'd like to maybe do something coming out of the book in relation to maybe some... Or delivering some training somewhere, mm-hmm. delivering some material to maybe organisations, grassroots clubs, you know, maybe professional football clubs, um, businesses, you know, in relation to mental health awareness or uh, resilience training, you know, anything that I can maybe draw from. So I'll have a, mm-hmm. I'll have a think about that. And I think from an academic perspective, you know, I'll have to maybe tap into some of the expertise we have in our workplace in relation to. You know what? What's maybe next steps for myself in in that realm if I decided to go down that path? You know, because I've come through like uh, degree, PGCE, masters, PhD. So I think I think the you know the next stage academically for myself would mm. be like to get professorship somewhere. I mean, yeah. but I think I think I'd have to write a lot more academic material and you know publish a lot more mm. um, to apply for one of those post courses. So there's a couple of maybe potential angles that I could that I could head down. Brilliant. So from Red to Red is available on Amazon. We'll put all the links to the book in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching this, they can click on that and purchase that. Um, Alan, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to speak to me um, as a friend as well. We've, we did this, the very first podcast that I've ever done was with you. Um, and obviously in this case, we're promoting this book, but I just want to wish you all, all the best with the journey of your academic uh, development as well as the the book and hopefully maybe in the future there could be potential other books from who you've inspired and all those different um, contemporary uh, aspects of psychology that are yet to be explored so just want to say thank you again uh, and good luck yeah, thanks so much Chris so yeah just on a, a final point there I think like now we've got something in place for the book I think it's there that it could be maybe built upon and still to this day, I'm driving home. And <laughs> I'm thinking of different stories that would have been quite amusing or funny, yeah. you know, to put in, but miss them. So the uncensored version. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that's something again that might be an opportunity. Now we've got something like a product in place. You might sort of like yeah. in a year or two, maybe add some bit, other bits and pieces, yeah. depending on on where I am in my life. But mm. yeah, thanks so much, Chrissy, for inviting me on. I really enjoyed it.